Greetings to all of you. My dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, a warm welcome to all of you from your pastor Yeti. Be comforted. Our study by the book of Isaiah. God is with us. And for today is Isaiah chapter 7 to 12. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord had given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 8, verse 18. This statement by the prophet Isaiah is a key to understanding the meaning of the events and prophecies in this section. In his previous messages, Isaiah focused on the spiritual needs of his people. But in this section, he deals with the political situation and the failures of the leaders to trust the Lord. Four symbolic names are involved in Isaiah's messages, each of them with a very special meaning. Emmanuel, Mahir, Shalachash Bas, Shir Yashub, and Isaiah. Emmanuel, a message of hope. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 15. I'm sorry, 25. A promise to King Ahas. There were perilous days for the nations of Judah. Assyria was growing stronger and threatening the smaller notions were security dependent on a very delicate political balance. Syria and Ephraim, the northern kingdom, tries to pressure Judah in an alliance against Assyria. But Ahaz refused to join them. Why? Because he had secretly made a treaty with Assyria. You can read that in Second Kings chapter 16, the verses 5 to 9. The king was playing power politics instead of trusting in the power of God. Syria and Ephraim planned to overthrow Ahaz and put the son of Tabil on the throne, and Ahaz was a frightened man. The Lord commanded Isaiah to take his son Shir Yashub, a remnant shall return, his explanation of this Hebrew name, and meet Ahaz as the king was inspecting the city's water system. Ahaz's heart had been wavering, and the hearts of his people had been shaken for fears. But Isaiah came with a message of assurance. Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. How would Ahaz find his inner peace? By believing God's promises that Judah's enemies would be defeated. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Faith in God's promises is the only way to find peace in the midst of trouble. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. In God's eyes, the two threatening kings were nothing but two smoldering stoops of firewood who would be off the scene very soon and they both died two years later. And furthermore, within 65 years, Ephraim, Israel, the northern kingdom, would be gone forever. Isaiah spoke this prophecy in year 734 B.C. Before common area. Assyrian defeated Assyria in 732 B.C. and invaded Israel in 7. 22 BC. They deported many of the Jews and assimilated the rest by introducing Gentiles into the land. By 669 BC, 65 years later, the nation no longer existed. A sign to the house of David. If Ahaz had believed God's promises, he would have 
broken his alliance and called the nations to pray and praise. But the king continued in his unbelief. Realizing the weakness of the king's faith, Isaiah offered to give a sign to encourage him. But Ahaz put on a pious front and refused his offer, knowing that he was secretly alienated with Assyria. How could Ahaz honestly ask the Lord for a special sign? So, instead of speaking only to the king, Isaiah addressed the whole house of David and gave the prophecy concerning Emmanuel. Of course, the ultimate fulfillment of his prophecy is in our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God with us. Matthew 1, verses 18-25 to and Luke 1, 31 to 35. The virgin birth of Christ is a key doctrine, for if Jesus Christ is not God, come in sinless human flesh, then we have no Savior. Jesus had to be born of a virgin apart from human generations, because he existed before his mother. He was not just born in this world, he came down from heaven into the world. Jesus was sent by the Father and therefore came into the world having a human mother, but not a human father. However, this sign had an immediate significance to Ahaz and the people of Judah. A woman who was then a virgin would get married, conceived, and bear a son whose name would be Emmanuel. The son would be a reminder that God was with his people and would care for him. It is likely that this virgin was Isaiah's second wife, his first wife, having died after Shir Yasub was born, and that Isaiah's second son was named both Emmanuel and Maher Shalachash Bas. Orthodox Jewish boys become son of the law at the age of 12. This special son was a reminder that Syria and Ephraim would be out of the picture within the next 12 years. Isaiah delivered his prophecy in 734 BC. In 732 BC, Assyria defeated Syria, and in 722 BC, Assyria invaded the Northern Kingdom. The prophecy was fulfilled. A warning to Judah. Instead of trusting the Lord, Ahaz continued to trust Assyria for help, and Isaiah warned him that Assyria would become Judah's enemy. The Assyrians would invade Judah and so ravage the land that agriculture would cease and the people would have only dairy products to eat. The rich farmland would become wasteland, and the people would be forced to hunt wild beasts in order to get food. It would be a time of great humiliation and suffering that could have been avoided had the leaders trusted in the Lord. Maher Shalach Hashbaz, a warning of judgment. Isaiah is married to the virgin and the legal documents were duly witnessed and sealed. He even announced that their first child would be a son and his name would be Maher Shalach Hashbaz, which means quick to plunder, swift to despoil. Since Isaiah's sons were signs to the nations, this name was significant. It spoke of future judgment when Assyria would conquer Syria and invade both Israel and Judah, and when Babylon would take Judah into exile. A child will be start speaking meaningful sentences about the age of two. In 732 BC, about two years after Isaiah's son was born, both Pekah and Rizan were dead, and Assyria had conquered Syria and begun to invade Israel. The army was quick to plunder and swift to take the spoil. In the remainder, I mean, in the reminder of this chapter, or I think it's the word remainder of this chapter, excuse me. Isaiah used three vivid contrasts to show the rulers of Judah the mistake they were making by trusting Assyria 
instead of trusting the Lord. First, they choose a flood instead of a peaceful river. The pro-Assyrian faction in Judah rejoiced when Assyria defeated Syria and when both Pekah and Rezin died. These victories seemed to prove that an alliance with Assyria was the safest course to follow. Instead of trusting the Lord, the waters of Shiloh, or Shiloh that go softly. They trusted the great river of Assyria. But they did not realize well that this river would become a flood when Assyria would come and destroy Israel and devastate Judah. God offered his people peace, but in unbelief they opted for war. They were walking by sight and not by faith. So second, they choose a snare instead of a sanctuary. God warned Isaiah not to follow the majority and support the popular pro-Assyrian party, even though its stance was looked upon as treasure. Isaiah opposed all foreign alliances and urged the people to put their faith in the Lord. The Jewish political leaders were asking, is it popular? Is it safe? But the prophet was asking, is it right? Is it the will of God? When you fear the Lord, and fear, I explain it again, fear is not being afraid of God. Fear means that there is a respect there is an adoration, there is an obedience in that word that you do and try to do the will of God. It's not running away from God. You don't need to fear people or circumstances. Peter referred to these passages when he wrote, but if, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. 1 Peter 3 verses 14 to 15. Isaiah compared the Lord to a sanctuary, a rock that is a refuge for believers, but a snare to those who rebel. The image of Messiah as a rock is found again in Isaiah 28 16. And see Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2 verses 4 to 7. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. Now the third thing is they choose darkness instead of light. The nation had rejected Isaiah's message, but that didn't mean that his ministry was a failure. The true disciples of the Lord received God's word and treasured it in their hearts. By faith, the prophet was willing to wait patiently for God's word to be fulfilled. But even if his words fell on deaf ears, Isaiah and his family were themselves a living prophecy that the nations could not ignore. Isaiah's name means Jehovah is salvation, and this would remind the people to trust the Lord to deliver him them. His older son named means a remnant shall return and this was a word of promise when it looked as though the nations were destroyed. I believe remnant did return to Jerusalem from Babylon, and they were encouraged by what Isaiah wrote in chapter 40 to 66. In their crisis, in the time of crisis, instead of turning to God for wisdom, the people consulted demons and this only increased their moral and spiritual darkness. The increase of occult, I mean occult in our own day, is evidence that people are deliberately reject God's word and turning to Satan's lies. If they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Judah's leaders anxiously looked for the dawning of a new day but they saw only a deepening darkness. 
God's word is our only dependable light in this world's darkness. And the word reflects and is Jesus. And God also worked through each of us to bring people back in his light. We move on further. Shir Yashup, a promise of mercy. This name means a remnant shall return, and the return of the Jewish remnant to their land is a major theme in these chapters. When Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, Ephraim, the nation was never restored but became what we know as Assyria. After the Babylonian captivity, 606-586 BC, the people of Judah were given another chance to establish themselves in the land, and through them the Lord brought the Messiah into the world. Had the remnant not returned, God's plans for redeeming a lost world might have been frustrated. How much depended on that small remnant? God's mercy to his people is seen in four ministries the Lord performed for them. First, the Lord promised them a Redeemer. Isaiah continued the theme of light and darkness by announcing there will be no more gloom. The Redeemer will come and bring to the world the dawning of a new day. We know that this prophecy refers to Christ because of the way it is quoted in Matthew 4, 13-15. The geographical areas named in Isaiah 9, verse 1, were especially devastated when the Assyrian army moved in, but these areas will be especially honored by the ministry of the Messiah. Jesus was identified with Galilee of the Gentiles and his loving ministry to the people brought light and joy. But the prophet looked beyond the first coming of Christ to his second coming and the establishing of his righteous kingdom. Instead of protecting a small remnant, God would enlarge the nation. Instead of experiencing sorrow, the people would rejoice like reapers after a great harvest, soldiers after a great victory, or prisoners of war after being released from their yoke of bondage. Isaiah declared both humanities, a child is born, and the deity, a son is given, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet then leaps ahead to the kingdom age, when the Messiah will reign in righteousness and justice from David's throne. God had promised David that his dynasty and throne would be established forever, and this is fulfilled literally in Jesus Christ, who will one day reign from Jerusalem. This kingdom is called the millennium, which means 1,000 years. The phrase is used six times in Revelations 20. If his name is wonderful, then there will be nothing dual about his reign. As counselor, he has the wisdom to rule justly, and as the mighty God, he has the power to execute his wise plans. Everlasting Father does not suggest that the Son is also the Father, for each person in the Godhead is distinct. Father of Eternity is a better translation. Among the Jews, the word father means originator or source. For example, Satan is a father originator of lies. If you want anything eternal, you must get it from Jesus Christ. He is the father of eternity. And second, the Lord judge Israel for their sins. This long section describes what will happen to the northern kingdom when the Assyrians invade while Isaiah's ministry was primarily, primar, uh, primarily <clears throat> excuse me, to the people of Judah. He used Israel as an object lesson to warn the southern kingdom that God does not take sin lightly. Judah had sinned greatly, but God, in his mercy, spared them 
for David's sake. However, God's long suffering would one day end. If God cannot bring us to repentance through his word, then he must lift his hand and chasten us. If we do not submit to his chastening, then he must stretch out his hand and judge us. God is long-suffering. But we dare not to tempt him by our careless or callous attitude. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then third, The Lord will judge the enemy. Woo to the Assyrian is the way this section begins, though God used Assyria to chasten Judah. Because of their arrogant attitude, God would judge Assyria for the worker certainly has mastery over his tools, like a wasting disease and a blazing forest fire. God's wrath would come to his proud nation and his army. In spite of Assyrian's conquest of the northern kingdom and its intention to destroy Judah, God would save a remnant so that the twelve tribes would not be annihilated. The remnant shall return, is the translation of the name of Isaiah's older son, Shir Yashub. 4. The Lord will restore his people. In contrast to the proud trees that God cuts down as he tends to shoot from a seemingly dead stump. Israel looked beyond his people's trials to the glorious kingdom that will be established when the Messiah comes to reign. David's dynasty was ready to end, but out of his people and out of his family the Messiah would come. A godly remnant of Jews kept the nation alive so that the Messiah could be born. When Isaiah looked at his people, he saw a sinful nation that would one day walk the highway of holiness and enter into the righteous kingdom. Isaiah, a song of salvation. Isaiah's name means Jehovah is salvation, and salvation is a key theme in this song. In that day refers the day of Israel, Regathering and reunion and the righteous reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jewish remnant will have come through the time of tribulation on earth, the time of Jacob's trouble, seeing their Messiah repent and received him by faith, cleansed and established in their promised kingdom. The nation will praise the Lord and extol him among the Gentiles. The refrain in Isaiah 12, verse 2, The Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation, was sang at Exodus, Exodus 15, verse 2, and at the rededication of the temple in Ezra's days. It was sung by the Red Sea after the Jews had been delivered from Egypt by Moses, a prophet. It was sung in Jerusalem when the second temple was dedicated under the leadership of Ezra, the priest. It will be sung again when the Jewish nation accept Jesus Christ as its king. They will recognize him as the Holy One of Israel and willingly obey his holy law. This, this joyful song closes the section of Isaiah in which the prophet has used four significant names to tell the people what God had planned for them. Because of Emmanuel, there is a message of hope. The Lord will never forsake His people, no matter how difficult the days may be, or how long the nights for the people of God. The best is yet to come. And this is the end of this part of study of the book Isaiah. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. Thank you for listening to this new study. I hope that it will encourage you. I know this is a very busy time during Advent and Christmas and all the, the holidays that are coming, but please 
take some time off. Take a quiet time to go through this and be blessed. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye.